conversation. And this is going to be very interesting because we're going to talk about what happens when people leave prison. And we have two really wonderful people to help us with this conversation. We have heard lots of different stories, um, but now we're going to look at what happens when people actually leave. And I have all the way to my right in red, Nika Jones Tapia. She's the executive director of the Cook County Department of Corrections. Just a little bit of background. Nika remembers visiting her own father in jail. He was incarcerated. And that was an active part of your life, thinking about what happened behind bars, visiting your father, talking to him through plexiglass. Yeah. And now you're the warden at a prison that has a very different approach yes. to dealing with prisoners yes. and a very different approach to dealing with the outside community. So we're going to hear a little bit about that. And Susan Burton is here, and she's the founder and executive director of A New Way of Life Project. After her sixth prison sentence in Los Angeles, Susan Burton was fortunate in that she was given access to, a treatment, to treatment services in Santa Monica. Yes. And it opened her eyes and made her realize, wait, if I have access to this kind of service in Santa Monica, why can't we have access to these kinds of services in South LA and South Central LA? And now she runs A New Way of Life. She helped her first clients in an apartment that she was able to, to get after she left the treatment center in Santa Monica. And we're going to hear a little bit about her story as well. Thank you so much for being with us, both of you. Thank you. Nika, I want to begin with you, if we could. Um, your, your father was incarcerated, so you grew up thinking about prison. I mean, many people, after that experience, would probably run as far in the other direction as they could. And now here you are as a warden of a prison, in a very large prison yes. in Illinois. Why did you decide to follow that path? And, why, and how does your early experience as a child who visited a father in prison inform the way that you run the prison now? Well, to answer your first question, I'm a firm believer in God ordering my steps for me. I did not set out to um, become the, the executive director of Cook County Jail in Chicago, nor did I set out for a career in corrections. But I do believe that those early experiences help shape and mold that desire in me. And I, I can say that I did never learn that I was an at-risk youth until I sat in my first college course in psychology. And in and, and hearing the definition of that, I thought, my God, because my, my reality was normal for me. And, and my mother, thankfully, helped you know, mold, shape and mold our family unit. So even though my father was in prison, we had Sunday dinners at the prison. Prison was much different then. Mm -hmm. This was in the, the 80s. And you know, every Saturday, I remember her cooking our, our Sunday dinner, and we would take it in a picnic basket to the prison. And that was my truth. And by not running from that truth, you know, I was able to grow into the woman that I am now. I obtained my doctorate in psychology and decided that I wanted to help other people that may not have had that supportive network um, to, to help them to, to rebuild life and to see life beyond that part of themselves. How have you tried to change the system so that an inmate coming to Cook County now has a very different experience. And you said, there's a quote that you had that you said recently that, you, that for, in many in the correction system, they would think that their job ended once the prisoner left the gates, right. you know, with that brown paper bag with all their belongings heading back into the community. You said that you, the, the prison system needs to stop thinking that way. Yes, yes. You know, for a long time, prison systems stopped correcting behavior, and we were guilty of letting go once a person left our doors. And what I've realized and what our sheriff has come to realize is that in order for us to really get at the root of the issue, we know that we have to come from a, a place much different than that. We know that we have to keep our arms wrapped around those individuals even beyond the point of leaving our jail. And so we offer therapeutic treatment. We give them job ready skills, education, and we follow them and have alumni groups where they come in and they teach young other men. Prison alumni groups. Prison alumni. Because that's interesting. Alumni is a, is a word that's usually attached to higher education. You yes. chose that word very carefully. Yes, yes. Because again, it, it's how you see your problem. And, and I've learned very early on that what isn't healed is handed down. 
And so we want it to really heal the individuals and, and know that they have a resource in us even post-release. And so we have alumni groups for people post-release from our jail coming in and talking to younger men about some of their experiences and talking with each other about some of the obstacles. And we have staff members that help them navigate those obstacles, again, while they're in the community. Susan, what are the greatest obstacles when you leave a penal institution? What, what, you know, help us understand the challenges and the obstacles that you face. So um, leaving a, a place of incarceration, coming back into the community, I mean, you're faced with the challenges of housing. You're faced with the challenges of uh, getting a job, uh, having an ID, having, you know, normal papers that, we, you, you know, we take for granted uh, so often. Um, and, you know, you're incarcerated, and for all the period while you're incarcerated, whether it's one year, two years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, you're not able to make such a such a simple decision as what I'm gonna eat tonight. So when you leave an institution, all of those uh, choices and living responsibilities are just given back to you. So it can be very overwhelming and daunting. Now, now, and help and us that's understand. why I started in the way of life. Help me understand that, yes. though, because when you say all of those responsibilities are given back and to you. And choices. And choices. That seems like it would be a gift. You get to choose when you get to eat. You get to choose where you live. But you're saying that that is actually something that's hard to take on after you've been living in a place where everything is dictated to you. Yes, yes it is. And, um, you know, you're, when you're incarcerated, you can ask something as simple like, can I go to the bathroom? You know, and but but when, once you're released and you're released back into the community and there's no supports, then you're kind of wondering, trying to figure out how you're going to make it, how you're going to make a good life for yourself, a changed life for yourself. Because everyone that I know have ever have, have ever known that leaves prison leaves prison with the hope and the intention of starting a new and better life. But, uh, you know, it can be overwhelming when there's no resources or supports to actually help you to begin to navigate that and support you while you step back into a place where you're making these new choices and decisions for yourself. And you're trying to do that now for other people as they leave, other women. And this began literally in your home, at the kitchen table. Yes. So um, after serving multiple prison sentences, um, I was given treatment. I was given treatment in a wealthy area, Santa Monica, and... Uh, Do you mind if I ask you, you know, you were, you, we had a chance to talk in the back. You yeah. said multiple sentences. You were, you were in a spiral at that point. In 1981, my five-year-old son named KK was accidentally killed by a detective, an LAPD detective. I, I, my life spiraled. I drank, then our communities were saturated with crack. I took, I smoked drugs, and I went to prison. And I went to prison over and over and over again. When I asked a judge for treatment and explained to him that my son had gotten killed, you know, I was hurting, I needed help, he still sent me to prison. So uh, upon my last re release in 1996, Someone told me about a place in Santa Monica. I made it to that place in Santa Monica, and there I found a community that was treated much different from the community I came from in South LA. People were, with the same amount of drugs or more, was diverted to uh, diversion programs. They were given court cards. They were given community service. They were not sent to prison for multiple years, and I, it dawned on me, like, what's wrong with this picture? Uh, when I, I left that treatment facility, I left committed to helping other women in South LA find a safe place and to begin the process of healing and directing them back into the community. In my own home, I saved, I worked, and I saved money and brought a little bungalow and there started a new way of life. So your first client? Who was your first client, and, and how did you decide that you could do this? That's a daunting task. Well, um, after so much had happened, you know, you kind of get angry. And that anger fueled the, 
inspiration and the determination and the thought. So I would leave the house and go downtown, Skid Row, Los Angeles, where women stepped off a bus. And I knew them, they were my stepped community. Off a bus leaving. Stepped off a bus leaving prison. Everyone comes downtown to the Greyhound bus station that's a stone's, a stone's throw from Skid Row. And as they got off the bus, I would greet them and I'd say, hey girl, you know, I have a house. You can come there and you can live. And it's, it's, it's a safe environment. And we created a community of formerly incarcerated women you know, supporting and helping each other. And I want to say that all of us were successful um, out of that group of 10, you know, the three bedroom house. We were all huddled up in there together and we were all supporting and nurturing and helping one another to overcome incarceration, to break the cycle of addiction and incarceration. Or I want to say uh, what I feel like is the trap of incarceration because when you're just sprung back into the community without any supports, there's not much left for you to do but to cycle back, so. Nika, I, I imagine that you, you don't want to see repeat customers. No, I don't. So when, when people leave Cook County Jail, what do they need that perhaps they're not getting enough of now to make sure that you don't see them again? Supports, you know, everyone will have a different need, but at the, at the very core, we know housing, education, many of the things that we've heard about today, and jobs, if you can't live independently and support yourself, then you're destined to return back to that life of But crime. it's hard to get a job if you have to fill out a form and say that you've been in jail. It's hard to get housing if you have to explain to a landlord or someone that you've actually spent time behind bars. It's hard to get an education because that costs money and you can't get the education if you can't get a paycheck. So. so with the program we started there at Cook County Jail, Sheriff Tom Dart and I, um, we, it's called the Mental Health Transition Center. We started it in August of 2014 and we had a, a job fair where we reached out to different agencies in the community and said, would you be willing to come into the jail and recruit new employees? And to see our gentlemen prepared, we gave them resume writing skills, interviewing skills. They had handwritten resumes that they gave. And upon discharge from the jail, many of them are offered jobs when they leave. And so I've, I've kept in touch with them through their alumni groups, and, and many of them are successful. To date, we have not had anyone to return to our custody that's been to that program. And is this being emulated in other places? Is this being emulated in other places? You know, I don't think that it is, but um, in speaking to some of the gentlemen that are currently incarcerated that are in the program, they've challenged me now to, to move this towards our juveniles. You know, I've heard many people speak today in, in, in other venues about the, the need to really prevent this cycle. And if we're really talking about true prevention, we need to look at our children. We're in an interesting moment where prison reform is being discussed and debated at very high levels. There is a, a bipartisan support, bipartisan discussions around this. There was an interesting moment this summer where President Barack Obama visited a prison. If you enter the White House, you see pictures that you haven't seen before in the White House with the president sitting down with men who are wearing prison uniforms, the president walking through um, a high security prison. It's because no other president has done that. How was that viewed in the prison community when he decided to do that? And, and, and what do you make of this moment right now? How important, how, what's at stake now that this is being discussed and we might actually see legislation? It's about time. It's, a, it's about time that, that someone sees um, our reality. And the, uh, the reality is much different than what I heard some of the gentlemen before us speak about, and that we are incarcerating individuals that should not be in jails and prisons. We are incarcerating fathers that need to be the heads of their households so their children don't continue in that cycle. We are incarcerating women who need to live successful lives to be mothers to their children and the mothers of the earth that they were intended to be. And so, you know, when, when I see our president to go into such a venue, I applaud him. I applaud him for taking that step forward and, and recognizing that we've been doing unjust things for so long that it's time for us to right our wrongs. Susan? So I was, uh, I was happy to see 
uh, President Obama visit a jail, a prison, the first president ever to do so. And he has uh, talked about uh, banning the box. And, you know, in 2003, a group of former prisoners met with the and met in Oakland, in the hills of Oakland, at the Center for Third World Development. And we uh, coined the phrase, ban the box. We began to organize under the banner of all of us or none. And the president has talked about banning the box. And I'm like, OK. Uh, so you're prison, talking about the box that you have to check on, the, a, on, on, on applications for, for housing, for housing applications right. for jobs, you know, applications just about across the board. And my thought is that, you know, that, yes, we want President Obama to ban the box, uh, an executive order uh, for him to ban the box on applications uh, on the fe for the federal, federal jobs and also contractor jobs. And my thought is, is that this is just the beginning. We have had 40 years of tough on crime, tough on our communities, tough on women, tough on, on, on men uh, laws that has driven our uh, criminal justice system into the, where we are with mass incarceration. So, uh, you know, I applaud him for that, but I also believe that this is the, just the beginning. We need more. We need 40 years of restoration to our communities, 40 years of rebuilding. Uh, our communities from the effects of the war on drugs and tough on crime uh, laws. We don't have a lot of time, but I want to make sure that we have a chance to get at least a few questions from the audience. And um, I don't, it's hard for me to see because the lights are so bright, but if anyone has a question for either Susan or Nika, we can get a microphone to you in short order. I think right over here. Um, my name is Aaron Coleman, and I have a question about the criminal justice system. A lot of times we reference how the private sector is used to increase mass incarceration and keep people down, but uh, do you all have any opinions on how the private sector can be used to help get people jobs and um, accelerate, like, deep mass incarceration? Mm -hmm. I didn't hear that. I, I, yeah, could you just repeat the last part of the question again, because it was hard for us to hear. Uh, just how... Uh, the private sector and business, like what role it can play in decreasing mass incarceration. We're always talking about how there's an economic incentives to put people in jail, but do you all know of any or have any ideas of what kind of incentives so we can use to get people out of jail? incentives in the private sector to actually keep people out of prison. Well, I would say that, you know, we can put a focus back in the community. And, and again, I'll go back to the children. And what we see, particularly in Chicago, where I'm living now, is is a, a trauma-filled uh, course of, of life for many of our children. You know, when you can't walk to the park and you can't walk to school without being in fear of being killed or being harmed, then, then you know that we need to intervene. So for our private sectors, I would, you know, encourage them and, and thrust upon them the need to reach out to our schools and our families and our communities to really engage them to figure out how we can reach our hand into that family system as early as possible. And I would say there needs to be an investment, a deep investment to build entrepreneurial skills within our communities to stimulate the economy and build real ownership amongst uh, business. So, you know, you can talk about getting a job or you can talk about making a job or you can talk about having a business. And I believe if our communities are going to be revitalized, there has to be uh, business ownership amongst uh, our, our community members that are, are formerly incarcerated in our communities as a whole. And I believe that will stimulate the type of economy and growth and allow our community, communities to thrive once again. Thank you for your question, Susan Burton, Kia Jones. Thank you, Thank you very, very much. Thank you.